Well, thank you all for coming today. So um, as you can see, there's a, a lot of interest in having uh, this lecture. And, and what I wanted to do for you guys today, and this is really geared towards the medical students who are visiting with us today, and um, is to talk about Chinese medicine as I've come to understand it, and to try to help you get a, a window into this medicine in just a very short period of time, but in a way that's sophisticated enough that hopefully you, you take home some valuable points. Right? Because part of the problem that our community, meaning the Chinese medical community has, is in conveying this information to biomedical practitioners in a way that, um, that makes sense at all. Because there's a lot of language barriers, a lot of language difference um, when we're talking about the different medicines. And so that's sort of a little bit of an attempt to do this and also to organize the discussion a little bit. So feel free to ask questions. I'll take pauses now and then. Uh, but just raise your hand or something, and, um, and we can have questions. Can you guys hear me back there? Frank, can you hear me OK? Talk a little louder? OK, <laughs> I'll try. All right, good. Well, thank you first to Pacific College um, for hosting us here. This is at the Pacific College of Oriental Medicine in Chicago. Um, also thanking to uh, the Integrative Medical Network, which is a, a, a project that I've been working on with Mitch Harris and a couple of other people to try to get lectures like this um, sort of hopefully high quality uh, lectures geared towards the professional community um, and also the public to help understand different aspects of integrative medicine. And so Derek's here helping us with that today uh, as well too. The objectives of the lecture uh, are multiple, and hopefully there'll be even a, more, uh, a few more that aren't listed here. One is to review the known history of Chinese medicine, understand the breadth of medical treatments and key concepts uh, that are important to the medicine, uh, identify challenges in research, because that's always a big question that we have, especially when interfacing with a biomedical system, is like, how do you prove the efficacy of what you're doing, and does it make any sense at all? And part of whether or not you get good answers from your research is whether you ask the right questions. And one of my contentions is that, historically up till now, lots of the questions that have been asked have not been the right questions. And so we'll talk about that a little bit more, too. Um, also, I'd like to ask you guys to be challenged a little bit to, to think about um, how you study human physiology. One of the, the ways, uh, one of the issues that we have is um, as we study physiology from a Western medical standpoint, we tend to base our physiology on a cadaveric model. And from the cadaveric model, we've moved on to using like a lock and key model with um, you know, channels and antigens and mechanisms that bind to things and then cause chemical reactions to happen. And that's all good and fine, but I want you to think as you go through your week, your couple of weeks here doing your integrative medicine rotation, and um, also through medical school, that you're being taught a very specific way of looking at the human body. And what Chinese medicine represents is an alternate way of looking at human physiology also based on observation and that the potential for combining our sets of knowledge together and understanding the human body and the human spirit and the human person in even a bigger way through our, our dual lenses is, is massive, I think, and um, offers a lot for, for everybody in terms of um, moving forward with a, with a medical care that's really effective for people. So, also improve awareness of the evidence base for acupuncture and clarify the training so you understand what it means to be an acupuncturist. My, my path to getting here has been you know, a little bit varied. I started out studying um, theoretical mathematics undergrad along with some philosophy and religion. I uh, took a year off after that and uh, taught English and was learning German in Germany and then went to a post -bac program at Bryn Mawr to get my science classes as well too. And then did my medical school at Brown University, my pediatrics residency at the U of C and then um, uh, uh, came to Pacific College uh, ultimately and studied Chinese medicine in a, a, a four-year uh, training program. Welcome, just have a seat. Yeah, thanks. Uh, in a four-year training program um, to uh, really get a comprehensive look into uh, Chinese medicine. I worked for about a year and a half as a hospitalist at Michael Reese Hospital before that. And I liked a lot of aspects of what I was doing in the hospital. Um, I liked the interventions. I liked interacting with people. There are, there are lots of pros to it, but I did feel like ultimately I was being left with uh, treatment tools that predominantly involved pharmaceutical surgery or reassurance. And, and there was not a lot for me to do in between those pieces. Uh, and I felt like that there, there had to be more ways of working with people and treating people than what I had been taught. And that's one of the things that had the question in my head that led me to, to continue study. Since that time, I formed an independent practice, a solo practice called East-West Integrative Medicine. I've uh, worked with Pacific for a long time doing curriculum design. I designed a pediatrics curriculum uh, and a number of other different modules, um, as well as doing disability evaluations, 
which is mainstream kind of Western medicine for a group called Chicago Consulting Physicians Group downtown. Also real involved in medical politics and things too. So the other thing that you guys should, should recognize as you do your, your weeks in integrative medicine is that what you're doing is to some degree a political act also, because there is a, a mainframe, mainstream biomedical community that is calling the shots now. And there are aspects of entry into that community that are controlled from within by the medical doctors. And as you guys think about things and open your minds, and if you start seeing things that like, why aren't we using this in treatment, you're gonna enter into interactions with your peers and with people who are in uh, leadership positions um, that are gonna demand some political changes in order for you to see those results. So if you decide you think acupuncture really should be available to your patients, you've gotta know that acupuncture is not covered under Medicare and Medicaid services now. There's no mandate to cover acupuncture. There's no guarantee of cover for acupuncture. And so if you want your patients to be able to get that under their insurance, there's a whole structure that needs to change in order for that to happen. So there is a lag time in terms of when we determine that something is potentially a useful modality for our patients and when our patients can actually access that modality. And you guys are gonna play a huge role in changing the paradigm that allows people access. So, so it's, it's both an honor and a responsibility. So Chinese medicine, a lot of what we base our, our decision making on and our approaches on in Chinese medicine is based on historical precedent, right? So we consider this to be essentially a multi-thousand year old uh, clinical trial that's been going on and tried on lots and lots of people over many years. And we base our, our thinking process and our decision making process in classic texts that have been informed throughout millennia uh, in various different ways. So one of the oldest uh, existing texts is called the Huangdi Neijing. And the Huangdi Neijing dates back to the Han Dynasty, which runs from about 200 BC to 200 AD. And the Huangdi Neijing is a very important um, document. This is one version of it here, too. There's just been a new two volume uh, Paul Unschuld version that's come out that's probably the most authoritative uh, source of it, but this is a real nice translation. Um, the important thing about the Neijing is that it's a compilation document, and it represents systems of thought that were in existence prior to its being written. And so when I say it, it represents uh, Chinese medicine as an organized system, uh, that's, that's what I mean. There, has been, there were hundreds of years of discussions that occurred before that text came out. And this is all very easily and clearly documented uh, from an anthropologic perspective. So you'll hear Chinese medicine's 2,000 years old, 3,000 years old, 4,000 years old, 10,000 years old. There's a fuzziness in some of the dates there too that are hard to exactly document. But we know it's at least this old. And you should know as well that the Huangdi in Jing covers not only just what we would consider sort of biomedicine, but also philosophy and sociology and mathematics and ecology and the way people interact with their environment. So its view of medicine and the physical body and how people interrelate with their environments and are affected by it is very much like the biopsychosocial model that was popular in biomedicine when I went to medical school, but seems to have faded a little bit um, over the years, depending on what program you're in. Uh, there are aspects of things discussed in the Huangdi Neijing that appear very archaic, uh, and um, archaic may not be quite the right word, um, arcane or, or hard to interpret. And some of that is also a translational issue. Some of the concepts in the Huangdi Neijing include concepts of yin and yang, yang, not yang, yang. Um, uh, and these were core, we say, to the yin yang school of the spring and autumn period of Chinese thought. So then we get back into 770 to 481 BCE. So now we have whole schools of knowledge and debate and thought and academics that were set up around this concept as far back as 770 BC. And then in 1993, um, there was a tomb called the Ma Huangdi tomb. Um, in the Hunan province that was excavated. And they found this book, Prescriptions for 52 Diseases, dating back to uh, 1065 BC. And that re represented the earliest surviving written record of Chinese herbal medicine. So the herbal medicine dates back at least then 3,000 years. But to have a book that's been compiled implies that people had been using the medicine for a number of hundreds of years, probably before that as well. So it is safe to say that the Chinese medicine easily dates back um, you know, as far as 3,000 years, potentially four to 5,000 years if we look at some of the bone oracle findings too, but those are a less sort of organized system. Those get into tribal shamanism, which has some ideas that get sort of mathematically encoded and brought forward, but are different um, sort of in how they were applied. 
One thing that gets confused a lot of times as well is this concept of classical Chinese medicine versus traditional Chinese medicine. And a lot of times you'll hear people talking about traditional Chinese medicine, and they really mean classical Chinese medicine, or you'll hear criticisms from your peers about Chinese medicine, and they'll say that Chinese medicine was invented in the 50s by Mao, right? So classical Chinese medicine dates back as far as I just told you. There's documentation of it. It's not debatable. It's anthropology. It's medical anthropology. It dates back 3,000 years plus. That's done. Traditional Chinese medicine is a distillation that did occur under Mao in the 40s and 50s. And there was a couple of things that drove that you know, to, to very much simplify the discussion. Uh, one was there was a need for medical care to be delivered on a mass, uh, to a mass population uh, at a very low cost. And another was an increasing interest in Western thought and Western medical ideas. So what TCM does is it took all the big thinkers of the time, brought them together, distilled a system of commonality out of that, and then systematized it so that it could be taught to people in much greater numbers and then delivered to the public. It took out of the medicine a lot of the thoughts about spirituality, philosophy, our relationship with nature, a lot of these kinds of um, uh, sort of more um, interpersonal or, or um, spiritual, really, ideas, and, and sort of clean that up because that was not generally seen as acceptable to Western thinkers and um, potentially threatening for, for other reasons, too. So that system, even cleaned up like that, ends up, this is a great sort of overview of that. This is a technical book. It's not for you to sit down and read. But it's just to give you an idea that even when you clean it up that much, there's a massive amount of information that you end up with in terms of treating patients and uh, looking at different ways of, um, of approaching disharmonies or diseases. So you do want to make that distinction. Chinese medicine was not invented in the 40s and 50s by Mao. TCM is a distillation of classical Chinese medicine that did occur in the 40s and 50s and represents a simplification of classical Chinese medicine. So overall, I like to think of classical Chinese medicine uh, as understood to be what I would call observational biology. And by what, what I mean by that is that um, the medicine seeks to classify um, behaviors in the context of the life of the people who would have been you know, living and, and what they were experiencing. So if you worked in a damp field in the hot of the sun, they would say that would correlate to specific physiologic disharmonies that might come from working that environment, right? And then also would look at certain you know, aspects of consciousness that go along with doing that kind of work, and also look at what kind of circuitry is within you that allows you to do certain actions. So um, we'll talk about the acupuncture channels later in a, in a few minutes, um, but I want to sort of change some of the language used from channel to maybe circuitry for our purposes, because I, I think that even though that may be a little objectionable to some of the Chinese medical community, um, I don't think it has to be. I think it actually gives us greater breadth of understanding of how the human organism may work. So it looks at things like diet and lifestyle, how emotions and outlook affect your physiology. They were observing people very, very carefully, and that was part of the, the, the uh, approach to learning at that time. And it would be hard pressed for any of us in biomedicine to say that this individual individual would not have a different set of disharmonies than this individual would have, right? I mean, that's kind of like, that's kind of basic. At the time, of course, there was no microscope, there were no microscopes, there was no um, sort of microbiologic or biochemical um, you know, system set up like we have now, and yet um, there was a systematized way of looking at cause and effect. So this really is a clinical trial that's been playing out on literally billions of people over literally thousands of years. And the Chinese historically and culturally are, are, are pragmatic people. They don't tend to hold on to stuff that doesn't work. And a lot of times this medicine really developed in a time period where, you know, people were dying from diseases. They weren't interested in just sort of, oh, I feel somewhat relaxed after my acupuncture treatment. They were like, my family is dying of cholera. What can I do about that, right? So they were interested in results. But also, I think we also underestimate the number of times the repetitions of different things have been done over the years. And so um, I just want to point that out uh, as well. So core to the concepts of Chinese medicine include the idea that there are observable, predictable, commonly shared patterns that guide nature in general 
and health, enhance health and human disease in humans. That's like the fundamental tenet of Taoism. You know, we exist in the Tao. The Tao has rules. Some of those rules include yin and yang. Some of the rules include the transformation of the five phases, which you guys do not need to know about at now, except that they exist. And, and so they were looking at systems. And people think of Taoism as being very, like, swishy and flowy and unstructured. And Taoism actually is extremely structured. It's a tight mathematical system and um, looks for repetition of patterns in nature and how you can move with those patterns. Not that the patterns don't exist, but how do you respond to them in a way that keeps you most healthy? They were deeply, deeply concerned with those questions. So when we think about the scientific method, right? you're thinking about observation and description of a phenomena, group of phenomena, formulation of a hypothesis to explain the phenomena, use of that to predict the existence of other phenomena, um, and then perform experimental tests of the predictions by several independent experimenters on billions of people over thousands of years. And so Chinese medicine absolutely follows the scientific method in the way it gathered knowledge and in the way it applies knowledge. Even now, as we have new systems that kind of spring up, people have ideas about like point protocols and ways of dealing with um, you know, problems that we're facing of pain control or something like that. They put out their, their, their system of ideas based on the classic system. A whole bunch of people go, wow, that sounds like an interesting idea. I'm going to try that in my clinic. They try that on their patients. They gather data. The data is shared in a community sense. And then if it works, it kind of hangs around. And then more people try it. And then if it works, it hangs around. If it doesn't work, people kind of forget about it and move on to something else. And so there's a criticism and part of um, Part of what I want you guys to understand, too, is that I'm responding to criticisms that I don't know if you guys have seen about Chinese medicine. But they're made by biomedical physicians and others who say things like, you know, Chinese medicine is based on a system of mystical beliefs that have no basis in what we understand to be science and should just be discarded outright. They will say that very clearly in, in their beliefs. And I want you to know that that is really, really spurious and uh, uninformed. So Chinese medicine is rooted in multiple philosophic religious systems, but the beauty of that is that that means that a lot of people from very different viewpoints are looking at the same body of information and to some degree coming to consensus. So there's an argument about whether the Taoists get credit for the five-phase system or the Confucians get credit for the five-phase system, but everybody wants to use the five-phase system because it's predictive, it's applicable, it's observable, and, and so it's, it's usable. So um, there can be debates like that, but we want to be careful that we understand what the, the real core of the debate is. Um, and, and I just also say that, too, that, that the dynasties in China throughout the thousands of years often were culturally very different from one another. They shared common threads, but they, they had their own flavor each time. And yet this medicine was able to persist through all those different dynasties. And so that tells me that people from very different sort of cultural angles were still able to see truth in this medicine. And it tells me as somewhat of like a medical anthropologist that if I'm not understanding it and if it sounds arcane to me, that's probably my failing and not the medicine's failing. And so when we're trying to use language in Chinese medicine, we're starting with Chinese characters that then get translated to pinyin, that get translated to English in some form, and then we try to understand. And sometimes that goes through French, or it goes through German, or it goes through some other language before it even gets to us. So we're trying to understand this, this, this medicine uh, from a different time in a different language, and, and that's pretty challenging. So the language of Chinese medicine is based on the observation of natural phenomena mirrored in the human body, but it's poetic. So if I talk about your heart, or I talk about your liver, or I talk about wind, or I talk about dampness, I'm using those as a, a form of medical jargon. And so if I say you experience illness from wind heat invasion, right? That's m a medical jargon for an expression of a pattern that I see clinically. It's not necessarily to say that all Chinese people believe all disease comes from wind and there are no such thing as viruses. That's not what they're saying. They're saying when you get sick with certain types of pathogens, it presents in a consistent pattern that I can identify, and there are also certain cultural and clim or, uh, environmental and climactic factors that mirror those same things. So if you understand s wind, you have to understand wind as wind, right? And the things that wind can do with you when you blow go out, it's like Chicago, so it's like negative, going to be negative 40 again soon, right? So wind cold is going to be a problem. 
right? But you can also understand wind as seizures because they move around the body in an unpredictable manner, very much like wind does. And so there's different types of wind, like liver wind, that is actually a seizure kind of condition potentially. There's intestinal wind, which is socially embarrassing, but seldom life-threatening. Um, and, and so different ways of using the word wind. Similarly, qi is a very broad-based term in Chinese medicine. You can't talk about Chinese medicine without talking about qi, but you can't pigeonhole the concept of qi only into some sort of abstract sort of life force idea and not understand its practical implications in the medicine as well. So there is an interest in sort of a vitalism and a life force and an inherent healing ability of the body that's expressed by the word qi, but the word qi gets used throughout the medicine in lots of different ways. So one of the criticisms I see is that the concept of qi has no basis in human physiology. That's like saying that like emotions and nervous system impulses and environmental, you know, heat or cold or damp or dry have no basis in human physiology. It's a nonsensical statement that just tells me that the person stating it doesn't know enough about Chinese medicine to, to stay quiet <laughs> and not say stuff like that because, uh, yeah. So, so what is Chinese medicine? I would say in very short, it's a self-contained, highly incorporative, whole medical system with theory developed through the observation of nature and the way individuals are reflected in and are affected by natural processes and environmental conditions. Um, that's sort of the, the, the skinny that I would give you right there. If you look at Asian medicine in general, as I said, it's very concerned with, with qi, of life force. That is one of the implications of qi, but not the only one. There's no absolute mind-body split, which I think is a really key point, and we'll talk about that more. Um, it always sees humans part of the natural world, and it believes that the body will heal itself if you give it the proper conditions with which to heal itself. There's a book that you guys should all read if you haven't. Have you seen this? This is a great book, and it's, um, it's right there, too. I think there's a second, edition, uh, a second edition out, but it's one of the most meticulously referenced books about sort of like looking at mind-body medicine and how thought turns into physical response. And so it's, it's kind of a psychoneuroimmunology text a little bit, but it's written at multiple levels, so it's totally professionally you know, solid, and yet you know, a person from the public could read it too. So I consider this to sort of be a really critical piece of background reading to do in general, because if we're still insisting on a mind-body split, we're not up to speed with Western medicine, because Western physiology would say that that is a bad split to make. So Chinese medicine, uh, um, so that's, that's the overview. So what causes disease from a Chinese medical standpoint? So they look at things like wind, damp, cold, heat, dry. These things are the external pathogenic influences, and these can be understood to be both actual external pathogenic influences and also patterns of things that can, um, that can be problematic. So heat can be um, you know, environmental heat, uh, or it can be like a heat toxin that comes in. So sometimes like lead poisoning looks a lot like a damp heat pathogen to me. Uh, when I see it in, in kids. So it's a way of categorizing phenomena again, too. The seven emotions, they, seven emotions very sort of generally said, um, are also said to be a big cause of uh, illness. And this is, again, looking at that mind-body connection and how consciousness affects uh, your physiology. And we'll talk about that a little more uh, soon, too. And then there's sort of broad categories of trauma and indiscretions of diet and lifestyle that can do that, too. And I just like this chart because this is um, cause of disease sexual taxation, which was seen to be as a big a big no-no because you have to maintain your jing, you have to maintain your essence and, and your capacity for reproduction for any number of reasons, and that, that concept jing in and of itself is, is uh, more complex than we can address today. But this is how detailed they got in their observation and their recommendations. If you were this age, this is in this type of health, this is how many times a day you should be ejaculating. Those are the rules. And if you're violating this, then you are not stepping in accordance with the Tao, and you have a cause of disease. Either too much sex or not enough sex can both cause disease. So I just think that's amusing. So um, pattern recognition overall is the, the guiding principle behind how you diagnose in Chinese medicine. And so consequent to that, there are numerous systems of organizing information and looking at different types of pattern. So from that concept, we see yin-yang theory develop, and then qi blood yin-yang theory. And then there's eight principal patterns, five element theory, five phase theory, zhang fu theory, channel theory, extra vessel theory, 
in all of these different ways of looking at things. And you even see evolution of thought occurring like later in time. So you get the, the cold damage or six stages of cold uh, invasion theory from the Shang Han Lun, which is uh, sort of towards the end of the Han Dynasty. But then you get the Wen Bing that pops up in the 1600s, so a very new player in Chinese medicine. Um, looking at hot disease and how hot environmental conditions and hot pathogens tend to damage the body. And you get schools of thought that build up around those. So in the current training in a full Chinese medicine program, you're going to study all these different pattern systems so that when your patient comes in, you're going to be able to identify what pattern best matches their disharmony. And it gives you the treatment principle that follows from that. Diagnosis can be different too. There, there are some similarities in diagnosis, some differences in diagnosis. So one of the differences is potentially uh, looking at tongues differently. So in Chinese medicine, there's a uh, elaborate system of tongue diagnosis and ways of interpreting this information. And you know, I, I just think that's got to have some value to it. You know, from even a biomedical perspective, we have a modified piece of skeletal muscle. You can't see this kind of thing anywhere else in the body. People stick it out, and they are vastly different in their appearance. And how we could say that a tongue that looks like this does not reflect a different physiologic environment than a tongue that looks like that, I don't see how we could make a medical justification of that. So in biomedicine, we have no system similar to this to diagnose this. And yet, you know, here's this large body of knowledge that applies it on a daily basis in clinics. So somewhere in there, there's got to be a conversation that could happen. Pulse diagnosis is also a very uh, structured and complex in Chinese medicine. This is not going to be uh, a legible slide, but that's, that's OK. It's not important. It's in this book, if you would like to uh, look at it more closely. Um, but it classifies different pulses as reflective of different types of, of human physiology. So treatment modalities, acupuncture is the most well-known treatment modality in Chinese medicine, but it is not the only treatment modality in Chinese medicine. Herbal medicine and nutrition, which go hand in hand, are a huge field. And what you should know about the herbs, too, is you'll see a lot of concerns. I've had doctors say, oh, you know, don't take those Chinese herbs. They'll kill you. Like, they don't know what they do. There's no data on them or anything like that. This is a, a textbook, one of two set, written by a uh, PhD pharmacologist and licensed acupuncturist. And uh, um, it, it is full of, of data about the herbs, including chemical constituents, studies that have been done, how they work from a Chinese medical standpoint, Western studies on how they work. So, so criticisms like we don't know anything about how the herbs work or things is like we know a lot about how they work. And yet it's easier to say we don't and to pass them off. Similarly, like the toxicity of herbs is often far overblown. And most of the herbs that are used in Chinese medicine have LD50s, in, in meaning safety levels, essentially, that far exceed anything we do in Western medicine. So as we continue to have 100,000 deaths per year from medical errors of medications given wrong and other things done like that, and that while we continue to have massive problems with, I just saw a, um, a headline saying that opioids are the new biggest drug of abuse for you know, young kids. Like, Chinese herbs are not killing people left and right. We got to be cautious not to throw stones at our glass house um, there, too, from a biomedical standpoint. Um, it's a highly structured system, very sophisticated, and, and just fascinating to kind of study. Tui Na Massage is a therapeutic massage system used in Chinese medicine. You'll see things like cupping here and gua sha. This is moxibustion. Um, Gua sha is an amazing technique that is, has been picked up by the physical therapist as well, sometimes called Graston technique, but it's gua sha. And um, it's, a, it's a very simple technique that uses a soft edge object, literally like a soup spoon, to relieve stasis from the tissues and bring it to the surfaces. And um, I've seen people come in with you know, chronic, I have one guy who came with chronic shoulder pain. He was getting MRIs. There are thousands of dollars of interventions done. They wanted to do surgery. We did a series of five gua sha treatments on him, and he's been good to go for years now. Like It brought up purple, dark stasis from the tissues. Um, the first time and the second time lighter, the third time lighter, and it just cleared up. And exactly what it cleared up from a biomedical standpoint, I don't think the research has been done. But it changes collagen fibers, it brings lactic acid and other byproducts of metabolism out of the tissues. It does those things, but it's also like it's a soup spoon. It cost a dollar to do. I mean, he could do it at home. The treatment cost for some of these interventions is, is virtually nil compared to what he went through to get to me before he went to surgery. And you don't always get treatments results like that, but you do sometimes get treatment results like that. 
Qigong is sort of um, the, you can sort of make it a little analogous to yoga. It's different than yoga in some critical ways, but it's, it's a vast study of movement and breathing and form. There are internal forms of it, external forms of it, meaning movement-based forms where movement is predominant and mental stillness is, is stressed, and other forms where um, physical stillness is stressed and mental motion is cultivated uh, in very specific ways. And then lifestyle modification uh, is huge, and insight and outlook modification is huge. So I want to talk about that for a second. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So that's a great point. So uh, that's a great point. So the question is, you know, um, not so much the toxicity of the herbs and things, but the standardization of the product and, and, and some safety issues too. So I, I should temper what I said by saying that, um, that the safety of herbs depends on knowing the source of your herbs. So herbs can be contaminated with heavy metals and pesticides. They can be like <coughs> substituted one product for another that kind of looks the same. You have all different degrees of quality of herbs based on where they're grown and how they're grown. So properly cultivated, properly sourced herbs are incredibly safe, but your patients preferably are not just going somewhere random and buying those products any more than they're going to the gas station to buy their whatever energy drink of the week is happening um, to keep them going. You want them going to someone who knows how the herbs were sourced, how to manage them, and that they were managed properly. So that's the argument for sort of licensure and development of a profession geared around that, because then you guys have some quality assurance, because it's not realistic for medical doctors to, to know everything about Chinese herbs, nor should you. You should focus on being the best medical doctor you can be, and if you want to learn a little bit here and there, that's great, but, you know, it's sort of like, you know, recognize, recognize where the excellence, you know, is on, on both sides there. Uh, so that's a good point, very good point. So this is from the Neijing, and this is the fourth failing of a physician. This is the knee translation. And uh, he says, the fourth failing occurs in counseling. When a physician lacks compassion and sincerity, when a physician is hasty in counseling and does not make effort to guide the patient's mind and moods in a positive way, that physician has robbed the opportunity to achieve a cure. So much of all illness begins in the mind and the ability to persuade the patient to change the course of perception and feeling to aid in the healing process is a requirement of a good physician. So how do you fit that in with your placebo issues, right? So people keep trying to design studies where patients lie on tables and you do standardized acupuncture treatments and you don't talk to them too much and you don't want to influence them and things like that. Like you can do those studies, but that's not Chinese medicine. That's not the system in which acupuncture evolved, which in the Neijing says you should be guiding the patient's thoughts. So I would encourage you to think of acupuncture and many of the other modalities as a, a facilitated cognitive gating essentially, rather than a placebo, because the whole concept of placebo here is so oversimplified as to be incorrect, um, because it's just not actually a placebo. It's, it's a different phenomenon that's better understood in this way. This was an interesting study done uh, in the journal Osteoarthritis, published in the Journal of Osteoarthritis, looking at um, <laughs> acupuncture, um, sham, and actual uh, for um, joint pain. And um, you can sort of skim through that, but I'll, I'll point you to the conclusion. In this study, the way it was done, the sham acupuncture, which is a problem in and of itself, was not superior to actual acupuncture. However, acupuncture, uh, 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 acupuncture styles, they were looking at the styles of the way the acupuncture was, was performed, had significant effects on pain reduction and satisfaction, suggesting that uh, the analgesic benefits of acupuncture can be partially mediated through placebo effects related to the acupuncturist behavior, right? And so as we discourage people from influencing the patient in their treatment, we move farther and farther away from a treatment that's likely to be effective based on the evidence that we know of how this works. That doesn't mean acupuncture is only a placebo effect, but it means you can facilitate its effect by educating your patient and helping them understand what they're supposed to be working on, essentially, too. And so that, that's a very challenging idea to create study models for. Um, looking at, at sham models, this was, um, there was no sham acupuncture group. This is a study of acupuncture versus effexor for hot flashes in breast cancer patients. 
um, they found acupuncture to be equally as effective as effects are for hot flashes, which is interesting in and of itself. Now, is effects are great for hot flashes? You know, that's a question. But, um, but either way, I would rather have acupuncture if I had hot flashes. Um, but also, the people, which I may at some point, uh, with acupuncture uh, had fewer side effects, more energy, and a better sex drive. And what this doctor concluded was, well, the thing you can't be argued by the study is the duration of the effect as well. It lasted, and the placebo effect doesn't generally last once you stop the treatment. You can have some duration of effect from placebos, but, um, but they found a much longer duration of effect. So something had shifted in the patient's physiology based on the treatment that was not explainable just as a placebo effect. So there are challenges to doing studies on this. So the use of traditional pattern recognition has been a, a big issue. If you come in for treatment of asthma, I will show you the different patterns coming up soon for all the different things that could be asthma. So if you design an acupuncture study to treat asthma, you're treating a Western disease modality, right? You're not treating the pattern modality from which the medicine was, was derived and intended to treat. Controlling for physician influence. Do you want physicians to be influenced in the outcome or not? Because some studies have already shown that if you intentionally employ that mechanism, you already know you're going to get better results. So yet why do you want to remove that mechanism? What is the motivation for taking the physician out of the doctor's office when you're doing treatments on people? And um, that goes with whatever type of medicine you're practicing. Uh, subtleties of improvement. Sometimes people get better over here when you were treating this. So you're treating their, you know, um, indigestion and their menstrual pain improves. It's like, do you count that as a win? Well, not if you're doing a study on digestion, but if you're the patient, you do, right? Um, and then creating a true inert placebo is very different as well, too, partially because one of the tenets of Chinese medicine is that the body is mapped out in a meaningful way, and every point on the body is both mapped out in a meaningful way and responds to to touch, and, and so there's no point on the body that's inert. You know, once you've already even cognitively directed a patient's mind to a part on their body, technically you've activated the point in some way. So that's tricky. So also, again, though, just using acupuncture in its original context, it's hard for studies to do that because it's such an individualized approach. TCM itself has been tried to sort of, to some degree, standardize things, but you're still having to meet the patient sort of where they are. So one of the key concepts is that treatment has to be tailored to the individual presenting rather than the disease presenting, and you have to alter your treatment as you go along. So here's those asthma kinds of diagnoses, and this is not an exhaustive list from Chinese medicine. So this is called Xiao Chuan or wheezing disorders, and all of these different things can cause wheezing. So if I have an asthmatic who comes in, are they an exercise-induced asthmatic? Are they an upper respiratory infection-induced asthmatic? Are they only wheeze when they smell perfume? You know, what's the conditions of that? Are they a big fat person? Are they a little skinny person? Are they eating a good diet? Are they eating a bad diet? Are they exhausted? Are they hyper energetic? We don't make those distinctions in Western medicine. Everybody gets albuterol. Everybody gets, you know, some sort of inhaled corticosteroid if, you know, they're a certain severity. The standardization of treatment is very routinized based on asthma. So if you're going to successfully evaluate, you successfully treat Chinese medicine, would say you have to have your right pattern recognition. And a lot of the studies that have been done are not paying attention to pattern recognition, and that's, that's a fault. So the other big concept, too, is that Chinese medical physiology is based on what we say is organ systems. And this, to me, is where it gets interesting as well. I mean, it gets interesting in other places, too. But this is a very interesting concept, rather than individual parts. So from Western medicine, if we're talking about someone's stomach, we're pretty much talking about their stomach, their physical stomach. I could cut it out of their body and put it on the pathology table and look at it. That's their stomach. In Chinese medicine, we're talking about the stomach system, which is this global system that deals with appetite, the ability to take in food and break it down, but also the same, anything that falls into that pattern. So the cognitive ability to take in ideas and break them down is part of a stomach kind of function. Certain appetites and motivations are stomach functions in Chinese medicine and are not in the biomedical model. But I'd ask you to consider things like hormones like ghrelin and oxytocin, you know, and I don't know how much you've studied those already, but ghrelin is a hormone that controls appetite but also behavior and motivation, right? It, it alters the way a rat runs through a maze and alters the way a rat does problem solving because it's motivated by food. Oxytocin is a hormone that's used for breast milk letdown but also pair bonding, sexual bonding, and, and social patterning. 
right? So when we look at human physiology from this standpoint, we're looking for the big system that ghrelin affects. And it's not just the physical stomach. It's the stomach system is one of the things it affects, as does oxytocin. So I can't make an exact one-to-one -one in this length of a lecture, but I th I'm hoping that you can see how much utility it would have medically to be able to name a global system and how that would be predictive of what we'd be looking for for that system. Things like ghrelin oxytocin that we didn't even know existed until recently, right? We should have been able to predict their existence. And, and in Chinese medicine, we would observe stomach chi and then leave it at stomach chi. It's all stomach chi, but there's things there too. And then with the organ system goes a meridian that in my, uh, my interpretation acts out the needs of the organ system. It's sort of the external manifestation of what's needed by the organ system to do certain types of work. And then based on the, um, the, the pathway of the, of the circuitry of that um, affects uh, lots of different functions. Sometimes it's just a local function effect. Sometimes it's a global function effect. But this gets into sort of the mapping of the human body. And we'll talk about that more in a moment. The liver system is a big, a big thing too. So in the Chinese medicine, we're talking about the liver system. We're not talking about the liver, the physical liver. We're talking about a whole system of, of function that involves your get up and go. It's your stress system. It's your activity system. It's what you use to go hunt and gather um, too. It's not just your physical liver. So there was a criticism made by a guy teaching a, a integrative medicine course at Stanford of all places who was saying things like, oh, the Chinese people, they just feel your pulse and say your kidneys are weak and it doesn't make any sense and blah, blah, blah. And, and he obviously didn't understand the fundamental idea that the kidneys don't mean the kidneys, right? When you're doing that translation to, to just dismiss that idea as, you know, sort of primi primitivist is, is essentially racist more than anything else. Um, so if you look at the stress system and all the effects of stress has on the body in Western medicine, which is what this probably unreadable slide is pointing you towards, but there's a reference for it. Um, you know, it'll talk about how it affects the respiratory system and the musculoskeletal system and the endocrine system and the cardiovascular system. We know that stress does all these things, but we don't categorize it into a systematic package. And in Chinese medicine, that package is the liver system. And we can map out the different ways the liver system affects other organ systems in various contexts. And it has a lot, a lot of utility. So functional systems are interdependent as well. So we have the liver system, which is about sort of acting in the world, hunting, gathering, the emotions associated with our anger and stress. But the positive qualities are compassion and leadership. Then we have this thing called the spleen system, one of the more poorly translated words probably we use, um, storing and containing food metabolism, information metabolism. So, so if you're, you're sitting nicely at a meal and you're eating, you know, your stomach and spleen systems should be dominant. You're in trying to incorporate food into your body. If your liver system is, is dominant, then you should be utilizing resources. You should be running. You should be doing something and you should be acting. So those two systems stand in contrast to one another and so you get patterns of imbalance when you try to do things out of harmony, like eat your you know, Big Mac in the car on the way to a meeting that you're stressed about getting to and you're honking at people and trying to shove this food down your throat. That's a lifestyle indiscretion and leads to a liver-spleen imbalance is one way of liver-spleen imbalance. Another way of looking at liver-spleen imbalance, we say liver invading spleen and stomach. When stress goes to your gut, that's liver invading spleen or stomach, depending on which part of your gut it goes to in Chinese medicine. When stress affects your ability to learn, that's another manifestation of liver invading spleen. It affects your ability to incorporate information into your mental body, which is a very physical kind of thing. It's very insulin dependent too, uh, as well. So lots of these irritable bowel disease kind of pictures, we could summarize up as being sort of a liver invading spleen issue. And if you look at this diagram from Alimentary pharmacology and therapeutics, which you probably all have on your bedstand next to your beds. Um, you look at the brain gut axis. Up in this little corner here is perception, which is probably the most important piece of the entire thing. But this looks at the circuitry that we know exists in biomedicine between perception and gut hypermotility, right? So we have within biomedicine already the understanding that our thoughts affect our physiology in this way. And yet when we apply that in the clinic, it's only very recently that people would have entertained ideas like doing hypnosis or biofeedback or acupuncture. There is actually a center now, I believe at, at Northwestern, that is doing integrative approaches to IBD and kudos for that. You know, that needs to, needs to have happened. Um, and, and stuff, but that is incredibly new that we're entertaining that. 
that whole system is already mapped out completely in Chinese medicine. So when we're trying to figure out what does stress do, it's all mapped out. Like, you know, if, if people look over, over here, it's mapped out. The students get irritated, I think, when I show this because I make them learn it. But this is, um, you know, this is the real HPA axis. We learned the H, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, but that is, is a cadaveric pluck out of the HPA. Um, it exists in the context of all these things. Your neocortex interprets situations and scenarios. Your limbic system deals with emotions and memory. Your hypothalamus is a transformer for physical, cognitive, and emotional experience that translates that into physical response. So then all those feed back into one another. So what our understanding of these axes is essentially from biomedicine that your mental state can directly affect everything from your adrenal gland to your gonads to your thyroid to your immune system. And that's another thing that this Scientific Base of Integrative Medicine book is really good at, at sort of showing you uh, really clearly. So we also have the individualities exist in an environment. So whether it's a hot, acrid environment, a stressful work environment, a luxurious, overprivileged environment, or a desolate, underprivileged environment, you've got to take that into account when you're treating your patient. You can't have someone come in and make a recommendation to them without taking into account the context, and you can't evaluate their disharmony without thinking about where are they going to go when they leave your office, right? That's just good medicine. To every physiologic state, there's always a corresponding psychologic state and vice versa. So whether it's like you know what that child's feeling right now, right? Without me telling you, you know his emotion, right? He's sad, he's crying, unless he's, there's certain degrees of like Asperger's literally where you have the inability to interpret that kind of uh, information. These girls are at the Beatles concert and they have too much joy is the pathology they're exhibiting in Chinese medicine. It will lead to spirit departure and essentially fainting and stuff too. But their emotions are mapped to a physical pattern, right? That's predictable and it's, it's transcultural it's not individualized, and in fact, it even goes to species. So if you look at the, do the dominant aggressive dog versus the fearful dog, this, this is a really cute website, and they, they basically like mapped it out. If the dog is doing this, it sy symbolizes that the dog is feeling these emotions, right? because that's the corresponding physiologic state. It's also the most functional state. If the dog needs to defend itself, it's going to gnash its teeth right? and do that too. So if we were to look at like the liver channel, the liver channel surrounds the mouth and controls certain facial posturing that has to do with grimacing and making that R kind of thing. So I could go into like an aggressive liver stance right now, and it would be threatening if I color it that way, or it may just be competitive or something like that. So there's mappable circuitry in the body. So what conditions can be treated? Well, it's a whole medical system, so really you want to think of it as sort of like, you know, it's got something to offer for everything. You know, there are conditions that are better treated and conditions that are better treated in, in various other ways and stuff too. Um, the World Health Organization gives a long list of conditions that it feels like acupuncture specifically is an appropriate therapy for. Um, we don't need to go through all of those. What I would say with some of these too is many of these are actually Western diagnoses. So, you know, in some sense, we could actually have a discussion about that too. There was a consensus statement on acupuncture that was a big deal that happened back in 98 that concluded that at least in the United States, there's clear evidence that acupuncture is effective for these things. Um, since that time, there have been other consensus statements that have come out. And what this slide is, which you have in the handout you guys can get, um, is a list of uh, PubMed references to consensus statements about acupuncture. So I just saw in some blog, someone was writing, well, there's no data to support the use of acupuncture anyway. It's like, holy cow, really? Can you go to PubMed and type in acupuncture? And, and so these are, these are not just individual studies that may or may not be decent. These are, these are consensus recommendations um, for various types of conditions. And so those are the numbers that you type in to get the, the study. So how does acupuncture work? Um, you know, that is a topic of study and debate, and it depends on how you look at the, the physiology of the human body. So we do have some understanding of Western mechanisms that occur when acupuncture is done. We know it releases endogenous opioids in some cases. We know that it modulates limbic and subcortical brain activity. We know that it can modulate the immune system and then it can and attenuate the autonomic response to stress. Those are biomedical mechanisms which are defined for acupuncture. I would argue that acupuncture works in a much bigger way than that. We'll talk a little bit about that, but we don't have too much time today for that. These are some studies that were done looking at um, functional MRIs, and they looked at uh, acupuncture points that were purported to have um, use for vision and points that were not indicated for visual kinds of things, and they looked at 
the, the patterns of light up between visual stimulation, acupuncture stimulation of the visual point, and non-acupuncture uh, points. It points it without visual uh, context and looked at the way the, the brain lit up uh, for that. And so that's kind of interesting. They did this also um, for some auditory points uh, that are supposed to have auditory kind of uh, effects to them too, and visual effects. These are visual points, uh, again, light up there too, GB37. And then uh, they also saw a similar kind of thing for the auditory. And um, so there's actually a, a large conversation that I would love to have around this type of research that we can't have right now. But it's interesting. It's an interesting way to go about sort of looking at functionality. But you know, again, remember, we're, are we looking at this as a cadaveric thing in a, in a cellular level kind of what's happening right at the point? Or are we looking at it as the body is an energetic matrix with circuitry that is standard throughout the species and also observable in animals and is tied in with our thinking and our mood and emotions? You know, um, and, and it, you also have to question how f deep do you want to go into the physics of this too? I mean, when you look at the body, it's when you look at everything, it's mostly empty space, right? There are rays passing through us right now that we're not even aware of, you know? And so there's energetic exchanges going on at all levels at all times that we just ignore because we don't need them for survival, apparently, to pay attention to them. But that's physics. Like, that's not, that's not even what we would consider biomedicine right now. And yet, you know, again, it was only within the last 100 years that we would have believed there was an energetic field around the body. And now we can look at things like functional MRIs or EEGs or, you know, um, lots of different types of medical, medical uh, ways of measuring those. And that, if you want to look at that too, this is another book called Energy Medicine, The Scientific Basis by James Oshman. That's one of the classics of energy medicine um, that's totally worth reading. He's got a couple of other books out subsequent to this one. And it'll talk about some of the, you know, how does the energy work in the body? What's been done to measure it? You know, what are different ways of looking at that? So that's another good one for your, your shelves. So I would say another integrated way maybe of understanding how acupuncture works is this. The body is not a, as a specific thing is, is illusory. That's just not real. Um, and it's not in keeping with our understandings of neurology. But it's rather a storehouse of experience and associative experience that has uh, evolved over time. So this is one of my favorite quotes. Colors, tones, smells, and tastes are mental creations constructed by the brain out of sensory experience. They do not exist as such outside of the brain. In short, our perceptions are not direct records of the world around us. Rather, they are constructed internally according to constraints imposed by the architecture of the nervous system and its functional abilities. This is from Principles of Neural Science, which was the neurology textbook we used at Brown when I went to medical school. So this is Western neurology saying the world does not exist as an objective thing. That's Buddhism saying that too, right? But that's also Western neurology saying that. The other thing that Western neurology tells us is that the body is mapped out throughout the nervous system in a homunculus fashion. So you have a sensory homunculus, you have a motor homunculus, you have a homunculus throughout your spinal cord, you have a homunculus on your cerebellum, your red nucleus, your frontal lobe, the projections from your frontal lobe to, to uh, other lobes are mapped out in a somatotopically maintained and pr preserved way. So that says to me the body is using the human form for very important informational organizational reasons or it would not have maintained this structure throughout evolution, right? And so I put, you can't quite tell, that's, that's, that's a bad kitty is what that picture is. And so kitty's lordosing, right? And so when you tickle kitty's back right at the top of its tail, kitty raises its rump in the air and lordosis, bad kitty. And the purpose of that is for mating. And um, the thing that makes cats so amusing is they can't help it. Um, whereas humans can inhibit that response sometimes. Um, <laughs> so that tells me that the cat didn't choose to have that part of its body mapped out in that way for that physiologic response. It's evolutionarily programmed into the circuitry of the cat to do that. The cat also has a somatotopic map in its brain. People have cut up cats and looked for it. There's some interesting studies on that. That's, you don't have to cut up the cat. Um, but that's the kind of mapping that's a functional systems-based circuitry mapping that's inherent in the body and that Chinese medicine has mapped out through its channel system. I would put that out as a premise. I can't give you the full lecture on that here right now today. But if that's true, to not believe that that's valuable, I, I, I don't understand how you could even make the premise that that's not incredibly valuable to our understanding of how human physiology works. So. Um, so I'll stop there for that. Now let me talk about 
training for Chinese medical practitioners. So there's different avenues for training, um, but currently um, most states require what's called National Certification Commission for Acupuncture and Oriental Medicine Standards, NCCOM Standards. California has its own board. Um, that's the other biggest board that's still out there. Um, but predominantly, this is recognized nationally. Two to four years of undergraduate college and university system, followed by um, about a minimum of, of 1,700 hours um, in an appropriately accredited training program. Most programs are 3,000 plus hours. Um, I can't remember how many program hours this is. This is like 4,000 or something when you get to it, right? The PCOM uh, course too, and that includes herbal medicine in it too. Um, Chinese medical students get about 450 hours of training or more in biomedicine, and the goal of that is not to make them biomedical practitioners, but to make them conversant enough in biomedicine to collaborate and to also understand when a condition presents that may better be treated by Western medicine to when to refer that condition. Because there are certain like acute conditions and really severely progressive, rapidly progressing conditions that Western medicine really excels at treating, and you want to make sure you don't miss those. Um, as well. So there's, there's fairly comprehensive, uh, well, very comprehensive training to become what's called a licensed acupuncturist to be NCCOM certified. And only after doing that do you sit for what's, they're, they're, um, they're not technically board exams because it's not a board. They're certification exams. They're national certification exams. It's essentially the boards is what that is. Now, if you're a medical doctor, you can um, get a short course training in acupuncture um, that has been around since around 1987 to 2000. Um, it's a 200-hour minimum, um, sometimes 300 hours. It depends on the program. And then there's a whole system of fellowship that follows from that that involves apprenticeship and logging of hours of your training. You should know that this is essentially going to give you an introduction to ideas in Chinese medicine, but it won't take you through the full system like the other training will because you can't do it in that amount of time. It's just not possible. So this is an introductory type of approach. It's also a protocolized type of approach and um, is often used predominantly for things like pain management. And then many of the physicians who do this do go on and study further um, in terms of, of trying to increase their knowledge of Chinese medicine. But it, it's not the same training. So just, just to be clear on that, the World Health Organization has actually set out recommended minimal hours. This is just for acupuncture. It is not for herbal medicine of what should be considered minimal training versus technician level training um, and how much, how much that should be and sort of what it should be considered. So the World Health Organization has some standards on that too. This is obviously an area of contention because um, a lot of times uh, medical doctors feel like they've gone through so much schooling, how could they not possibly know just about everything there is to know about the human body, so why can't I just learn acupuncture and just add it on? And the answer is because it's an entirely different way of looking at human physiology and a complex whole medical system that demands that you, you just evaluate way more information than can be done in that amount of time. So um, <coughs> there's that too. Acupuncturists are not called the same thing in all places. Um, the entry level certification names, or these are like state licensure title names, include things like licensed acupuncturists in Illinois, DOMs in Rhode Island, uh, I can't remember who's an OMD, CA's in Wisconsin, AP's in Florida. So all of those names are different based on state. So a couple places you can find some more information. Um, this is one of the first books that came out that really busted open interest in Chinese medicine. A lot of people, The Web That Has No Weaver by Ted Kapchuk, who's now at Harvard, um, doing a lot of placebo research, interestingly, and um, has done some just amazing work on that. And um, this is really a technical manual, sort of the first part of it is introductory to Chinese medicine and then it becomes more of a technical manual, um, but it's a good source. Um, there's a book called Between Heaven and Earth by uh, Ephraim Korngold and Harriet Beinfeld, which I don't have with me. That's another one. Uh, Livia Cohn, uh, who's a Taoist scholar, I believe at Boston University, wrote this book too. It's a good overview book uh, as well, not a technical manual. So those are all good, good reference sources too. Um, hopefully, we'll have some good teaching lectures there at some point in the very near future. And then the National Center for Complement and Alternative Medicine is one of the National Institutes of Health uh, Institutes, and it has a lot of information on Chinese medicine. They try to keep up to date on like studies that have been released specifically related to acupuncture, Chinese medicine, other aspects of Chinese medicine, and so that's also uh, a good reference site. Sometimes your state association websites, the NCCOM website, um, an AccuFinder actually can be one to help you just find a practitioner. 
Uh, in Illinois, we have the Illinois Association for Acupuncture and Oriental Medicine, uh, who's the main professional association, uh, along with the Asian American Acupuncture Association, uh, is the, um, the er, both organizations are open to everyone. The a, Quad A is, is mostly um, Asian cultural, and uh, ILM has done sort of more general kinds of membership kinds of uh, outreach too. Uh, but they work in partnership very closely. So that's what I want to say. And so what kind of questions do you guys have or anybody has? Uh, feel free. Or comments. Also, there's a lot of Chinese medical practitioners here too who may disagree with me about things I said. Please tell me too. Yeah, guys. There's actually a few of us that are going into pediatrics. Mm -hmm. so I was just curious how acupuncture fits into pediatrics. Mm -hmm. And when yeah. That's a great question. So I'm a pediatrician too, right? That's my, my, my training. So my, my practice has a lot of outreach um, to pediatrics. You can, and so the answer to that is it, it depends essentially too. So you can technically do acupuncture in any age group, but what you mean by acupuncture is going to be different. So there's all different styles of acupuncture from relatively thick needle, heavy stimulation kinds of acupuncture to very light, barely putting the needle in Japanese style kind of treatments. So you can do light treatments on any age. You don't use heavy, heavy needling on kids. So it depends on what the practitioner is doing, right, and what they know. You can do uh, Twina at any age, and that's an amazing tool to work, um, to work with kids with. So like any kid who comes in with like headaches or musculoskeletal complaints or sleep disorders or digestive complaints, you know, start with uh, a Twina protocol, like a massage protocol. It's totally safe. The family can do it at home. They can apply it daily. In, in many cases, the kids love it, the parents love it, and that works well. Um, dietary modifications are part of Chinese medicine. That's always core to child care. Uh, lifestyle modifications are huge in Chinese medicine. That's core to child care uh, issues as well. So nutrition, diet, lifestyle. Herbal medicine can be used very young if you know your sourcing of your herbs and how to dose them, which is not hard. You know, you just have to know. Uh, so all of those things can be applied from the birth period when done correctly. Other questions? Other comments? One question now, this engineering and conventional anthropology. And yeah. Uh, with any um, formalized system that you know has texts that date back X, you know, hundred thousand years, uh, have, have there been any like major you know, controversial paradigm shifts within so Chinese like, medicine? Even in Western medicine, mm -hmm. back 150, 20 years ago, I mean, there's major dogmas that were dog, dogmatic. Right. Then there have been. That's a great point. So the, right, the question is, uh, have there been major paradigm shifts in Chinese medicine as more documents are revealed and more and more uh, like texts emerge? And I would have to say no, that, that there haven't been. The fundamental premises of Chinese medicine, <coughs> including like yin yang theory, channel theory, uh, five phase theory, things like that are very stable. Um, what you see is differences in application of those theories. You see differences in the way pattern recognition occurs so that you have new sort of branches of medicine like the Shang Han Lin branch that's, that's um, emerging uh, quite strongly thanks to uh, our own Steve Bonzak and a number of other people have different ways of organizing the information but they all have at the core the same fundamental premises about yin and yang five phase. And, and those kinds of things. So they may organize things slightly differently, but that doesn't, it hasn't drawn the fundamental theory into question. Yeah. Yeah. It's not from like a Western medicine standpoint. You know, like for you guys, if there's a kid coming in with like an asthma and they're tapping, you right. know, hopefully it would be burnt kind of out to the Right, well, and like it depends. Are there red right. flags from a Western medicine side, like, I don't know, what's your top five things? Great question, yeah, yeah. Some acupuncture, right? So the question is, like, there there are clearly sometimes when when Western medicine shines, and we want to be in the emergency room, or we want to be on a certain medication, or things like that. When does um, Chinese medicine shine? And so overall, I would say Chinese medicine especially shines in um, the early detection of things and the early treatment of things be before things become a train wreck. So if you can do that, that would be ideal. Um, that said, I have seen amazing results. Um, for lots of um, viscerally based things, so GI complaints, headaches that fall into that category, menstrual disorders, fertility issues, all of those respond very well to acupuncture. Um, lots of different pain syndromes respond well to acupuncture and body, body work therapies. Massage too is huge as a, as a wonderful intervention for people. Um, 
uh, as part of a, a comprehensive treatment system. Um, what else? Anybody want to throw one out there? Anything else that you see? Chronic conditions, right, either subclinical conditions or just chronic conditions. Conditions where people have gone to 20 different doctors, no one's been able to figure out what's going on and they don't know how to treat them. And part of the reason that this medicine can sometimes be helpful is because you don't need to know the biomedical me mechanism that's messed up to figure out how to treat the person. You just need to know their pattern diagnosis. And it doesn't mean they always get well, but sometimes they get well, like, amazingly. And so it's something that people should absolutely try. Yeah, so chronic conditions. Uh, naughty conditions, like we call those things that are hard to sort of pin down or hard to diagnose sometimes could be really well treated. Great. All right, well, um, I'm going to, we'll stop the, the sort of formal part of the lecture and hang around. We can have a uh, conversation and stuff too. But thank you all for coming. If you have feedback, I value that. So please let me know. And um, yeah, all right. Thanks. <laughs>